sponsored by the Indian Council of Social Science Research, ICSSR. This time, ICAN is organized in a staggered format, which will take place at four different venues across India and abroad. Phase 1 will be held in Delhi Metropolitan Education, Noida, from 19 to 21st June, and Malakrishna International Institute of Research and Studies, Faridabad, on 22nd June. Phase 2 will be Markal Lajpur International University for Journalism and Mass Communication of Art on 21st July and Dakarim International University of Bangladesh on 5th to 6th August 2023. I would like to take a moment and introduce organizers of the conference in our audience. Delhi Metropolitan Education, DME, is an 8th grade premier education institute affiliated to Guru Gobind Singh in the Press University, New Delhi and approved by the Bar Council of India. DME Media School is one of the most promising institutes in the country. It offers free in journalism and mass communication. It is recognized as a school focused on the growth of its faculty and students through academic and co-curricular activities. ICAN 6 has come with a theme, identity, culture and agenda driven newscast with the hashtag culture identity for diversity. ICAN 6 has support of more than 21 parties. The conference is support, sponsored by Indian Council of Social Science Research, ICSSR. Conference partners are IAMCR Gen Section and GMED Global Media Educational Council. Knowledge partners are Manu Rachana International Institute of Research and Studies, Faridabad, Mathilna Chaturvedi National University for Journalism and Mass Communication, Bhopal, Adams University, Kolkata, Institute of Applied Medicines and Research, IAMR, Gaziapur, and K KSF, Keshav Sudhi Foundation. International partners are Defodil International University, Bangladesh, Institute of International Journalism, Ohio University, USA, Beacon House National University, Pakistan. Media partners are The Policy Times, Jai Times, Quick News, and News 44. ICANN 6 is powered by Asian Media and Culture Studies Network Australia, Australia, Indian Film Practitioners and Researchers Network Australia, SPA, the Student Council of DME Media School, RIM, Research and Innovation in Media, Research Cell of DME, Rickman Fellowship Society India, Delhi Branch. Since 2018, DME Media School has been organizing the International Conference ICANN. The themes for the former edition were Indian and changing aspects of news in ICANN 1, Indian cinema and alternate networks in ICANN 2, issues of community and ag uh, agenda and news in ICANN 3, information, communication and artificial networks in ICANN 4, inclusivity, convergence and alternative negotiation in ICANN 5, and now identity, culture and agenda driven newscast in ICANN 6. This unique conference is conceptualized by Dr. Nambi Saxena, Professor and Dean of DME Media School, with the convener of ICANN 6. Now, I invite Sir to facilitate our guest and deliver his opening address. I'm happy to share that journalism under DME is the official newsletter of DME Media School. This fortnightly publication covers all the major activities happening in and out of camp. It is a student-centered newsletter carried out entirely by them under the supervision of faculty members. DME TV is an official YouTube channel where you can find a playlist related to all the lecture series, film festivals and conferences. For more information, follow us on our social media handles and YouTube channel DME TV. Today, we are all here for the technical session on entertainment, landscape and streaming platform, changing narratives on OTT platforms and YouTube. The session will be chaired by Dr. Kiran Bala, Professor at Mana Krishna International Institute of Research and Studies, Faridabad, Haryana, and co-chaired by Dr. Shifali Chibbar, Assistant Professor of DMP Media School. Dr. Kiran Bala is Professor and Head, Department Journalism and Mass Communication at Mana Krishna International Institute of Research and Studies, Faridabad. She is former Dean and Professor, School of Journalism and Mass Communication and Dean Research at T.R. Mangalam University, Kurma. She is professional with diverse knowledge, a doctorate in Mass Communication, Gold Medalist in PG in Mass Communication and Gold Medalist in PG Diploma in Translation, Postgraduate in English, PG Diploma in Market Management, UCG Net Qualified. She has many feathers in her cap, a qualified media personality. She is a researcher 
and dedicated a that mission to more than 20 years of public relation and public communication teaching experience at both college and university levels. The co-chair of the technical session on site board is Dr. Shepali Chitra, assistant professor of the MU Media School. She is doctorate in mass communication, postgraduate in rights, advertising and public relation from Mahan Lachit with the National University of Journalism and Mass Communication in Pakistan. Now, I hand over to co-chair to take the session for us. Good afternoon everyone. By the permission of uh, our uh, head, Bala Ma'am, and our chair, Dr. Kiran Bala, I would like to start with the presentation. The, pro the first presentation for today's session is by, is by Soumya Sharma, research scholar, uh, faculty of Media Studies and Humanities. Break, uh, the title of her paper is Breaking Barriers and Challenging Norms, a Discourse Analysis of OTT Content. Uh, hi, good afternoon everyone, good afternoon sir. So I think I'll just start with the presentation. So as you can see the title, uh, and uh, I don't need to... Okay, okay. So I'm Soumya Sharma and I'm doing a PhD from Manav Russia International Institute of Research and Study. And this is the title of my paper. Uh, so initially just talking about OTT a little bit, how OTT has basically emerged as you know, a, a popular platform in the last uh, few years and how uh, many factors like we have seen in many research like internet connectivity, accessibility of devices have contributed to its rise in popularity. Also uh, many researchers and researchers and reports have uh, you know, concluded how COVID-19 or the lockdown also basically increased the popularity and the growth of COVID uh, of OTD and uh, there are, this is the data presented. Also, one notable aspect of OTD which we know is that OTD platforms don't only have new content which they are exclusively releasing but also have old classic content and then also exclusive content that is being released on OTD. So it provides a platform for both kind of content. So some of the factors that uh, you know exclude OTD from the traditional, uh, you know, differentiate them from the traditional media landscape is that they have the options of uh, watching the content in your own language, obviously the convenience of watching it at your, at your own pace and time. So this is a little bit about OTT. And uh, the theme, like the paper, focus of my paper is basically how some content you know, OTT that we see is very different in its treatment because a lot of content that we see nowadays uh, deals with, you know, bold issues and sensitive, sensitive and complex themes and we can see many examples especially when we talk about Indian content, films and series that have done this. For example, Delhi Crime, Sacred Games, Serious Men, School, The Heart, these are some of the recent examples. And among these examples is a film, is basically an anthology that came on Netflix called Ajit Dastans and one of the short films in that anthology is a film called Giri Puchi. So this particular paper is focused on that. So this is uh, this paper analyzes this particular film and how the film deals with various complex issues and multi-layered themes. And how, which is basically the theme for this presentation also, OTT as a platform serves as, uh, you know, uh, serves a platform which basically lets the filmmakers, creators, even the viewers to explore such sensitive and complex issues in a more creative manner. So these are the two objectives that I'm focusing on. The first one is to explore uh, basically the content and structure of this film that I've selected. And secondly, to find out how the content contributes to the uniqueness of OTT as a medium, which I'll talk about in my presentation further. Uh, so the review of literature, I'll just put like a few examples here. Uh, talks about, many researchers have talked about OTT and how the platforms and the popularity has grown over the years. And the factors, uh, you know, responsible for that. One of the researchers, Yuta Mani, in her uh, work has talked about how the OTD deals with the content differently, which I was just talking about. That how OTD is not just uh, producing fresh content, but also kind of reshaping the storytelling technique and is uh, showing the issues and talking about issues which were somewhere not very openly talked about in the earlier traditional, you know, in the earlier media. And there are more and more content, uh, like more and more series and films which deal with su such issues. Uh, this is the ROL. Uh, 
so the methodology that I've selected for my uh, paper is uh, for basically is qualitative and uh, I have done discourse analysis for analyzing the particular film that I've selected. And obviously the film in itself is the primary source, uh, you know, also the other researchers done by other scholars and other books and papers, but the film is the primary uh, source for the research. And discourse analysis, when we talk about discourse analysis in films, obviously some of the main or key elements that we uh, basically uh, explore are how symbols, metaphors, scenes, narratives, dialogues, language, all these are dealt with in the film and how they basically construct the story or how they basically tell a story or shape a story in a different way. So that is uh, what I have tried to focus on. And how also they deal with, you know, underlying ideological and power relation and uh, social norms. And the theory that I have uh, chosen for this particular paper is Dalit feminist theory because of the variables that, uh, you know, are there in the film. So Dalit feminist theory is, the, the, it, it provides a framework for studying the intersectionality between caste, class and gender. Which is uh, which are the key themes in the film, which we'll see now, and their intersectionality between them. And these are very really multi layered and complex themes, and this particular theory deals with those themes only. Uh, so, like I said, uh, I'll show you this more in detail when I talk about the uh, findings. But data analysis has been done by uh, transcribing dialogues, which is the language, and studying the narrative structure, the sequence. Uh, analyzing each and every scene in the film, obviously backed by other researchers as well. Uh, so, finding in discussions, uh, just a little bit about the production details about the film. Uh, that it's a short film that is part of, like I said, the anthology that got released on Netflix uh, called Ajit Dasta. It came uh, in April 2021. Neeraj Kewan is the director and writer. Uh, and actors in the role, Konkana Sen Sharma as Bharti Mandal, uh, who is the main, one of the main characters, and Aditi Rao Henry as Priya Sharma, the other protagonist. So, uh, just a quick, you know, like just a, a brief introduction about what the film is all about. So, it basically tells the story of Bharti Mandal, who is an educated worker in a factory, and she wants to, she aspires for a high, higher job of a data operator in the factory. But due to uh, caste discrimination and other factors, she is not able to do that. And then uh, she meets another worker who is doing that job, who is Bharti Mandal, played by uh, Aditi Rao Henry. And how both of them go through their own struggles, friendship, relationships, because there is also an angle of, angle of LGBTQ in the film. So uh, this film particularly deals with that. And how Bharti kind of breaks away from the social uh, constructs or, you know, the patriarchal setup that we'll uh, find out. So uh, Bharti, Kanpana uh, Sharma, she's, uh, she's from a Dalit background and uh, again like she's struggling because of her identity and her caste and everything but then how she overcomes that through uh, her own like you know by challenging those norms is what the film basically focuses on. So discourse analysis of the film. Uh, main elements that uh, I've tried to look at when you know while doing the discourse analysis of the film, obviously themes and variables, the issues explored in the film. What are certain themes and variables that we can find out after watching uh, the film several times? The narrative structure of the film, how the film basically progresses. Then key scenes and dialogues that I've identified and tried to put under all the themes and variables that I've found out. And similarly, visual elements, obviously, because in film studies, how visual elements in the film kind of uh, add to the themes and variables or they either support or are, you know, are not support the uh, variables that we have found out. So uh, the basic themes and variables that I have uh, found out in the study, like from my study in the film, the first one is obviously caste discrimination. Throughout the film, uh, throughout most of the scenes and visual elements, we see that caste discrimination is one of the key uh, issues that has been talked about in the film, that has been dealt with. And we generally see that caste is something that a lot of films have been made on caste. But now we see that because of OTD, there are more and more films and series that basically put light or shed light on this particular issue of caste discrimination. 
So, uh, because I could not uh, put all the scenes and you know the detailed scenes in the presentation, I just tried to put some screenshots and I just tried to explain through these the screenshots. So, this is just a conversation between Bharti and one of her co-workers where, where she says that why I can't get the job of big data operator despite having the qualifications and the skills required for that. So, uh, her co-worker reminds her that in case you have forgotten, we are Dalits and we can sit on the table and eat with you know in the office, but we cannot maybe get the job. So this is just how uh, it kind of indicates the struggles that uh, people go through who belong to a particular caste. Similarly, uh, Priya Sharma's mother-in-law, when Bharti comes to her uh, place for her birthday, she first the first thing she inquires about is what uh, Bharti's caste is, obviously, because the Priya belongs to a Brahminical uh, household, so she's concerned about that. Again, because uh, one of the scenes where Priya had lied about her caste initially, she says she's a Banerjee, but later when she reveals that to her friend and companion in the film, uh, Priya, uh, she says that, you know, I'm a Dalit and my grannies and my uh, uh, people, like forefathers, they used to do the work of nannies. She kind of, she's holding her hand, but kind of, uh, you know, releases her hand uh, on knowing this thing about her. Uh, another thing which uh, I have also mentioned in the visual element is how the treatment of uh, people like, uh, from a different caste or Dalits is sometimes very different than the, uh, the treatment that is given to people from the upper caste. So the film clearly shows towards the end of it, like in one of the last scenes, that when tea is being served to everyone, Bharti is there too, uh, and the tea is being served to her in a different cup, you know, it's in a steel glass, which you can see. So it is one of the examples of the visual elements. The other thing, the other issue or variable that we see in the film is class disparities. So it is not just caste that the film explored, it's also the theme of class that, like I said, because uh, Dalit feminist theory is about intersectionality of caste, gender and class. So this is another another thing. We see in, throughout the film that the place where Bharti and all her co-workers work, the blue collar job people, how they are treated differently, the space that they work in is very different from how uh, Priya uh, you know, is treated. So that is there. And uh, this is one of the scenes where uh, Priya tells Bharti that the manager has uh, told her not to go downstairs to have lunch because, because there are very weird people there and it stinks. So that is also kind of representative of you know, the class disparity. Another scene uh, shows uh, when they are having a birthday celebration inside Bharti's cabin that how the manager or how her boss treats her by just calling her inside and instructing her to distribute the cake to everyone while treating uh, Priya in a different manner and because she has that class privilege as well. Uh, then gender uh, relations is another theme that has been explored uh, in the film and gender uh, relations not just how the patriarchy works in the society but uh, or, you know how women are often subjugated uh, but also how LGBTQ like the concept of LGBTQ is also there. So one of the scenes Bharti's co-worker we see that like, he starts abusing her and he even slaps her and makes sexual comments on her but she fights back. And uh, another thing which is a very important scene in the film is how because Bharti is the only female worker in the factory, there is no washroom for ladies till the time Priya comes or Priya joins the office who again is, belongs to an upper caste in class but uh, till the time Bharti is there who has been working in the factory for several years, there is no washroom for, separate washroom for females. So uh, this is another scene. LGBTQ like I said, it sheds light on same sex relationships by exploring both of their characters, their past relationships, also the struggles that they go through and the problems that they cannot reveal their true identity to the society very openly. That is also a theme explored in the film. So uh, Priya asking Harti when she's not able to understand her own sexual orientation despite being married, she asks her if there is some defect in it uh, in her and if she should go and seek medical advice because she's not able to understand her own orientation. Uh, one of the most important uh, variables uh, you know that has been explored in the film is power structure. Now when I say power structures uh, through uh, many examples and researches and papers and books, uh, power structure is also about, like I said, intersectionality of not just power structure in context of gender, but also class, but also how people who belong to a particular caste and 
gender are often marginalized and how uh, they basically dominate the ones who belong to a lower caste. So this is the scene where Aarti is asking her boss why she cannot get the job despite having the right qualifications. He makes some excuse and he says that you don't know uh, how to do Excel in this particular software so you cannot get the job. Whereas just after a few scenes we realize that Priya doesn't know the, uh, any of them but she gets the job just by reading the palm of the manager because she knows palm reading. Uh, so it is also a satirical thing when she says that I am from a Brahmin's house so I know palm reading and just that is all she tells in the interview and she gets the job. So it clearly shows us a sharp contrast and comparison between how both of them instead uh, Bharti being more qualified and skilled doesn't get the job but Rupiya gets it very easily. I am just concluding. Uh, and just one more important thing in the power structure, towards the end we see in the films how these power structures are subverted by the powerless. So when Bharti realizes that Priya is also being a part of those who are basically oppressing and she is also not uh, supporting her, so she makes a plan uh, of obviously getting the job by making a strategy which she has been trying for, for a very long time. So this is where we see there is a subversion of power by the powerless. So Priya who has been shown as a victim uh, till this point of time, see, she basically starts dominating the narrative further. So these are just scenes I'm going through where she basically works out the whole plan. And then once Priya becomes a mother, she tells that focus on your baby and you should not resume work again. So here we can clearly see that now Priya who has been on the uh, you know higher side, she is basically powerless and speechless and she cannot do anything. Also because she belongs to this Brahmin uh, setup, so it has been shown in the film that Despite Bharti being from a, uh, a particular caste, she is very open about her sexual orientation, identity, caste. She is not scared of it, but Bharti is actually scared of revealing her own identity because of her family setup and values, and because she is the ideal wife and uh, daughter in law. In the art design, we can clearly see how uh, the distinction is there in the workplaces. The place where Bharti works is dirty and has been shown differently whereas Priya's workplace is very clean and organized. And also, Bharti is the only worker who dares to go upstairs, so it kind of symbolizes through the art design that she's the only one who tries to basically break those uh, norms of class and caste. Uh, also, there is a sharp contrast in the scenes of both of their apartments. So we can just see it here. So this is about Cinematography throughout the film we see how camera movements and how camera angles and lighting shows uh, all these narratives and themes that we are talking about. So, uh, and the last scene that I am talking about, so it ends, the film ends with Bharti sipping tea in her steel glass which her mother-in-law, Priya's mother-in-law has given her. So basically she is kind of accepting her identity, like who she is, but she is also fearless and she has now gained victory by getting the job she always wanted and this expression of her sipping the tea in the steel glass and looking at Priya without blinking also kind of tells us uh, a lot. So this is also visual representation. Uh, I'm just quickly going to finish. Costume design and color again we see Priya the whole time dressed up in a very proper uh, female like you know in a proper sari and suits whereas Bharti is mostly can be seen in wearing clothes that are considered masculine. Also the color of Bharti's uniform is blue, which is which we can go to the historical context of Dalits and uh, Savarnas, uh, along with the blue cylinders that surround her in the factory. So uh, in the conclusion we can see through whatever uh, you know, I've tried to uh, look at in the research is that how Kiribuchi is a thought-provoking provoking film that basically dwells into a wide range of complex social challenges like we talked about gender equality, LGBTQ rights, caste discrimination. And Bharti obviously like we talked about this, uh, we see the whole film through her point of view, through her perspective because in the cinematography the camera is her companion throughout the film. So we see how she features a strong minded protagonist. Despite these challenges of caste, class and gender, she still doesn't give up and she doesn't basically, you know, in gets involved in self-pity, she rather has the courage to challenge these norms. And obviously the fearless approach that the film has uh, in addressing these topics, which are generally not a lot talked about or very often talked about in other mediums is uh, one of the highlights. 
and also it talks about the platform how OTT as a platform also gives the space for creators to make such content or the viewers to watch or consume such content that deals with these, these issues fearlessly and in depth. Yeah, so uh, it kind of puts light or reflects light on how the creative freedom is more on OTT platforms also the treatment is different. So these, I think these are two of the points that conclude this. So that's it. Lots of, lots of writers and all, so we have to look around that. 
which I suppose with my findings and my uh, question and analysis, it has come to an answer of yes, they are being affected, negatively affected by the uh, creative freedom of the OTT platforms. A few important questions that uh, tell us that yes, they are being uh, negatively impacted are that uh, when I ask people if they feel that creative freedom is more in the OTT platforms as compared to the traditional media, most of them agree to the uh, uh, agree to the notion and answered yes. Then the next question was, do you think that too much exposure to the OTT content has negatively impacted the young generation? As in the pie chart, we can see most of the people, like 51% of the respondents have answered it as yes. And it is uh, the studies of about 150 respondents. According to you, which of the following problems can be seen among the youth due to the content? Major part of the uh, youth can see violent behavior among them due to uh, the rise in desensitized content in the OTT platforms. OTT platforms have mostly desensitized, desensitized their approach towards their content by involving extreme instances of violence, drugs, nudity. Do you agree? 40.3% of people have mildly agreed. Have you come across an OTT platform that you have found offensive or inappropriate? Surprisingly, 75% of people have found it that yes, they have come across offensive uh, scenes and actions during uh, their uh, spending time uh, watching the OTT platform content. The conclusion of the study and the recommendations are that it's a suggestion to the censor board that the OTT content shall also be reviewed and analyzed before it is streamed online. The censorship shall be more actively implemented on the OTT platforms. Revised set of rules and regulations should be prescribed by the government. The content creators, directors and producers should also act responsibly towards the future of the country. The creative freedom should prevail in the innovation of uh, storylines of the contents rather than the demonstration of dis uh, disturbing action or Thank you.
thank you for your presentation, Natasha. I hope, hope you, are, you will integrate these points in your study. The next presentation that we have uh, is by Soumya Gupta and Shivani Singh. And the title of their paper is Analyzing Agenda Setting in OTT Content. And Content Analysis and Approach. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shivani Singh, along with my colleague Soumya Gupta. Today, we are delighted to share our research paper on the topic Agenda in Entertainment Content. We construct of agenda in entertainment content refers to the ability of the media to shape public opinion by determining what issues are given the most attention. Entertainment content has long been recognized as a powerful medium that not only entertains but also influences individuals and society at large. So basically we are going to show that how entertainment, agenda entertainment content influences uh, the mindset of people and how it influences individuals and society at large. From films and television shows to music and uh, literature, entertainment media holds to holds the potential to shape public opinion, reflects cultural values and advocate for specific agenda. So, entertainment media has the power to influence public opinion by uh, presenting certain ideas, perspectives and narr narr uh, narratives. For example, uh, film and television shows can uh, raise awareness about social injustice, promote empathy towards uh, marginalized communities or challenges prevailing stereotypes. Content creators strategically embedded their viewpoints into their works, employing various storytelling techniques, symbolism, and messaging strategies to promote their agendas effectively. The significance of studying agenda in entertainment content lies in its potential to shape public perceptions, influence social discourse, and impact cultural norms. Through storytelling and visual representation, media can shape how people perceive various social, political, and cultural issues. Entertainment media creators uh, cater to reach a vast and diverse audience through transcending geographical and demographic boundaries. The analysis of uh, demographic boundaries. The analysis of the agenda in entertainment content also sheds a light on the working of entertainment sector. So we have seen that entertainment creators uh, have vast diverse audience and uh, to reach, despite of their culture, religion, and geographic boundaries. And we have also analyzed that uh, agenda in
raises public perspective, holds social discussion, and contributes to the overall cultural environment. This ongoing research deepens our understanding of agenda in entertainment content, empowering, empowering audience to engage with media consequences and promoting informed discussion on societal implications. Seems this can't be achieved even in
लीडर ने कैंपेन टूल यूज किए ट्विटर में और अपने पॉलिटिकल एजेंडास को सेट किए मेरा मेरा जो रिसर्च पेपर है वो इनसे इसलिए अलग है क्योंकि इनकी जितनी भी स्टडीज है वो टू टू थाउजेंड फोर्टीन की है और मेरी टू थाउजेंड नाइनटीन की है इस समय के बीच में इंटरनेट के यूजेस है वो काफ़ी बढ़ गई है ऑब्जेक्टिव ऑब्जेक्टिव ये है कि हम जान सकें कि ट्विटर में जो पॉलिटिकल कम्युनिकेशन होता है उसमें क्या इम्पैक्ट पड़ता है पब्लिक में दूसरा कि जो पॉलिटिकल एक्टर है किस तरीके से अपने पॉलिटिकल कम्युनिकेशन या एजेंडा सेट करते हैं ट्विटर में तीसरा कि ये कैसे हमारे कॉन्टेम्प्रेरी पॉलिटिक्स को सोशल मीडिया अफेक्ट करती है और लास्ट इसका ये है कि ये जो स्टडी है हमें मदद करती है कि हम जान सके इंडियन पॉलिटिक्स के ब्रॉडर ब्रॉडर ट्रेंड्स को जो आने वाली पॉलिटिक्स को शेप करेगी मेट्रोलॉजी इसमें पहले मेट्रोलॉजी में पहले इंडियन एक्सप्रेस की रिपोर्ट को मैंने जाँचा जो कि नाइन अप्रैल टू को हुई ये रिपोर्ट डिजिटल फॉरेंसिक लैब की रिपोर्ट को बताती है जो ये बताती है कि ऑटोमेटिक बूथ का इस्तेमाल करके कैसे एजेंडा के इलेक्शन के दौरान एजेंडा सेट करते हैं इस इसको इसी इसी का आइडिया लेके मैंने पब्लिक ओपिनियन को जानने के लिए एक सर्वे भी किया गूगल फॉर्म पर लेकर जिसमें मैंने क्वेश्चन लेयर क्लिक कर दिए इसलिए ये जो मैंने सर्वे किया ये जो सर्वे का हम तीन क्वेश्चन के आंसर जानने के लिए टेस्ट करने के लिए सर्वे किया से पहला क्वेश्चन ये था कि जो पॉजिटिव रिलेशनशिप एजेंडा सेटिंग और ट्विटर के बीच में होता है दूसरा ये जानना था या जो पॉलिटिकल पार्टी सबसे ज़्यादा इंगेज होती है ट्विटर में क्या वाकई में इसकी जीत होती है और लास्ट ये जो फेक ऑटोमेटिक बुक्स हैं ट्विटर में वो क्या पब्लिक के ओपिनियन को इन्फ्लुएंस करते हैं तो इसके लिए मैंने क्वेश्चन एयर लिया इस क्वेश्चन एयर में वन ट्वेंटी सिक्स लोगों ने रिस्पॉन्स दिया और उसका एज ग्रुप था एटीन से ट्वेंटी वन यंगस्टर थे हमारे कॉलेज की बी जी एम सी एल एल पी और बी बी ए के बच्चे थे उनमें से जो पहला क्वेश्चन था हाउ ऑफ्टन डू यू यूज़ ट्विटर फॉर पॉलिटिकल न्यूज एंड इन्फॉर्मेशन सिक्सटी फाइव पॉइंट वन परसेंट लोग ने कहा कि वो काफ़ी फ्रिक्वेंट ट्विटर को यूज़ करते हैं पॉलिटिकल इन्फॉर्मेशन से दूसरा क्वेश्चन भी कुछ पॉलिटिकल पार्टी और कैंडिडेट डू यू फॉलो ड्यूरिंग द इलेक्शन सेवेंटी थ्री परसेंट लोगों ने कहा कि वो बीजेपी को फॉलो करते हैं और अगर आप टू थाउजेंड नाइनटीन के इलेक्शन में भी देखें तो ट्रेंड यही था कि बीजेपी इतनी मेजॉरिटी थी सेकेंड नंबर में कांग्रेस हाउ डिड यू ट्विटर इन्फ्लुएंस योर परसेप्शन ओपिनियन अबाउट द पॉलिटिकल पार्टी एंड कैंडिडेट जिसमें सिक्सटी पॉइंट एट लोगों ने कहा कि उनका सिग्निफिकेंट है उनके इन्फ्लुएंस पड़ता है ट्विटर में जो भी डेटा आता है जिसमें से ट्वेंटी थ्री पॉइंट एट लोगों ने कहा कि माइनर इम्पैक्ट पड़ता है और कुछ प्रतिशत लोगों ने कहा कि नहीं पड़ता हमारा फोर्थ क्वेश्चन है डिड यू कम अप्रोज एनी पॉलिटिकल मिस मिस इन्फॉर्मेशन प्रोपोगेंडा ऑन द ट्विटर ड्यूरिंग द इलेक्शन सिक्सटी टू पॉइंट टू परसेंट लोगों ने कहा कि हाँ उन्होंने वो मिस मिस इन्फॉर्मेशन या प्रोपोगेंडा फेस करते हैं इलेक्शन के दौरान ड्यूरिंग ट्विटर वुड यू से ट्विटर आर प्लेयर
बताती है कि कैसे पॉलिटिकल एजेंडा को ट्विटर पे यूज कर ट्विटर पे इंसाइट स्टडी बताती है कि कैसे ये पॉलिटिकल एजेंडा ट्विटर में दिखाए जाते हैं दूसरा ये बताइए किस तरह ये जो हाई रेगुलेशन होता है सोशल मीडिया का इलेक्शन के दौरान ताकि वो पॉलिटिशियन अपने पॉलिटिकल एजेंडा को सेट कर पाए और लास्ट में ये बोला जाए कि एक प्रॉपर अथॉरिटी की भी जरूरत है जो इस चीज़ को कवर करे कि ट्विटर में जो इंफॉर्मेशन है वो वैलिड है कि नहीं
that's how I got the uh, students for it. Uh, I prepared a, a question uh, for this uh, study and uh, it was open-ended of course in the focus group. So it was uh, open-ended. Uh, I recorded the data, then I trans uh, transcribed all the data that I had. Uh, I made uh, themes accordingly. And, uh, but themes uh, couldn't get, uh, gave me the results. So what I did was the names. Uh, every time they were using Grammarly, positive hai ma'am, advantages hai ma'am, disadvantages hai ma'am. So I made the themes accordingly. Now I'll come to the findings. Uh, first was first objective was usage of AI chatbots among students. Uh, it was uh, first question is how I asked uh, about how much do they use it. So I gave them this option because uh, otherwise it was getting very bit confusing. Some of them was trying to be very modest in any hand they use karte. So I just uh, gave them uh, this option that uh, never, rarely, sometimes, often, and all uh, and always. Often was the answer that I received. It was when uh, Dani mentioned it was a 3.5 out of 5. Uh, the major thing that why they are using these uh, applications on chatbots was uh, because they have a lifestyle where they are occupied with so many of the projects. Uh, they also have this uh, lifestyle when uh, they have to go, uh, they have their social gatherings. They have to go out uh, to socialize. They have uh, some of them are even working, so they don't have time for it. Also, one of the major finding was there are uh, projects or subjects they are not interested to work in. So what they do is they just uh, Google it, so they, they just type their assignment, and they get the result. And also, one of the finding was which I have not mentioned uh, was that teachers are not even checking the regular. Uh, we don't uh, go to turn it in and check the regular assignments, right? So they were like, okay, ma'am, so we are happy about it. As I mentioned already, uh, the most common uh, and popular was Grammarly, Canva, Quillboard uh, in uh, AI, and chatbots was uh, uh, chatbots chat chat GPT followed by Google. The second objective was to find the impact of AI and chatbots on higher on students in higher education. Uh, so they were both positive and negative impact. As I said, ki the times they use. Word, you can get positive, you can get negative, you can get advantage, you can get disadvantage. Accordingly, I have used to the positive uh, impact includes students get personalized and real time tutoring, which make them understand complex concepts better and improve their grades. Uh, this, they suggest idea, uh, and the third is that uh, it saves their time. Uh, there are a lot of negative impact which came as a surprise because I really thought that they will come up. Uh, they will come up with this uh, positive impact more, but they have their more negative impact that students have mentioned uh, their, during their discussion. Uh, first uh, negative thing is that they it cannot uh, they cannot rely on it because uh, wherever the source is, the source is not reliable. So they already know about this that the source is not uh, reliable. Second is that there is no authentic data. We cannot uh, make the data that they are uh, giving is not that authentic. Uh, then we have this uh, uh, six server security. Every time you are checking something, you, your data is going uh, to the server. So that is that was another problem. It lacks human emotion. Uh, there was a question if uh, uh, that we asked that if by any chance you get the chance that your teacher to class that I have because every time it, uh, uh, you know the teachers wake up, there is a message that student would be to Google Happy Teachers Day because you are the biggest teacher. Right, so uh, when asked about this, they just said he, uh, human emotion is something that we cannot even think of. Again, expectation is uh, from students what they expect is accurate data. Limited or less, uh, they have very less option. For example, if they type or write an essay on something, they have a limited data. So if I am copying it and uh, she is also copying it, we get the same data. So, it's the same data, so there has to be more data. Uh, plus the duration, again, uh, every Google Bard has a data from 2022. Uh, Chat GPT again has a data from 2018, so it's very limited. More genuine content is the other thing that they were giving. Just, just, okay. Uh, so, uh, obviously, just a second. So, uh, obviously, there is no doubt that it's helping, but we also need to uh, understand that uh, when was launched, uh, this uh, Sam Hartman, uh, who happens to be the ChatGPT uh, CEO, he already mentioned 
that it's educator who needs to be more advanced. So, so it's going to be a tough fight for both educators and uh, students. Also, there are a few more analysis and slides. Obviously, 
virality of the nature, that is social sharing, localization and regionalization of the content. And it is another factor and again, uh, the, another factor is that a bite size content. So, brevity of the content is another factor that has contributed to the growth of the short form of videos. Now, my objective of my study is to understand the correct consumption pattern of short form videos in India. To identify the key factors driving the rise in consumption of short form videos in India. To investigate the dynamics of content creation in the short form videos ecosystem including the motivations, aspirations and experience of content creators. So, uh, my study uh, has been designed keeping in mind that I will, have, I will do the both qualitative and quantitative analysis. So, I have conducted a survey using a questionnaire and this will determine the usage preference. This has determined the usage preference and the impact of short form videos on their daily lives, their habits, their behavior. And I have gathered the quantitative data and to gather the qualitative data, I have, uh, I have like uh, interviewed uh, people uh, from the focus groups. Uh, and uh, I have gained, gained insights into the qualitative analysis of factors contributing to the growth of these uh, short form videos. And then I have analyzed the social media metrics and uh, the contributing factors which are responsible for the growth of social media. So my key findings of the analysis of social media platforms like uh, this, this the short form video industry is expected to reach dollar 5.5 billion in revenue by 2023. And it is a, it is a growth of CAGR from 30% CAGR from 2019 to 2023. In 2020, the daily active users for short form videos application in India reached 1.1 1, 1, 1, 1, 115 million which is almost two times the number which was there in 2018. The average daily time spent per user on short form videos apps in India increased from 21 minutes in 2018 to 32 minutes in 2020. I have not told the recent Texas data with me. So though TikTok was banned in 2020, it was the largest platform with 20, 200 million users. This wide identified by other locally known social media platforms. Uh, so mostly the growth of the, these platforms have been in the type and dietary cities and 70% 70 of the total short form videos in the base is from that, these cities only. Uh, short form video apps also become popular platform for influencers and brands to reach out to their target audience. The report estimates that the influencer marketing industries in India will reach dollar 2 billion in 2023. Now, my the key findings of my primary research is for various stakeholders. The rise in the short form media consumption has several implications for stakeholders in the digital content industry. Uh, for, first of all, it is for the content creators. We, we have increased opportunities and more monetization potential for them. Second is for platforms and aggregators. They have they are they are increasing the user base. They have more advertising revenue. They will have uh, more content curation and recommendation. Uh, recommendation to the audiences. Advertising for advertisers and marketers. They have they will have access to engaged audience. The influencer culture is gaining popularity, so they have gained access to the engaged audience than the native advertising options. Then users will have convenience and entertainment and also the participating cultures like they can participate in various challenges and other uh, quizzes and other engagement opportunities which are there in the, uh, in the short form videos. And application, uh, sorry, implications for the traditional form of media is that there is a change in the habits of media consumption uh, then the attention of the competition to gain audience attention audience fragmentation uh, and this coming to the conclusion. Evolving advertising landscape, the content, ad uh, content adaptation between 
both the traditional as well as the short form videos and cross platform integration is there. So, uh, short form videos, uh, this is my summary in conclusion, short form videos characterized by their brevity and easy accessibility have been a profound impact, have had a profound impact on millennials who are generation born roughly between 80s and 1900s to early 2000. So, here are some key effects of short form videos like they have changed their, this, this short form video trend has changed the consumption habits. Now, they, this has added to the creative expression in, in, in creating videos, has, uh, has created an influencer culture. Now, if you go for buying anything, we prefer to watch a video before we can make any informed decision. So, then it contributes in, in information and education, it contributes in a social connection. And obviously, with social connection, it creates the influence of culture. Then, it's also about the attention span and multitasking. So, short attention videos are gaining more popularity. So, overall, short form videos have revolutionized millennial media consumption habits by providing bite sized, mobile centric, and personalized content options. They have empowered millennials to both consumers and creators to be both consumers and creators reshaping their relationship with media and giving rise to new content consumption patterns. So in conclusion, uh, short form videos have significantly impacted millennials media consumption habits, creative expression, access to information, social connections and even attention spans. While they offer convenience and entertainment, it is important for millennials to maintain a balance and ensure they are engaging with diverse range of content formats for a well rounded experience.
I would also like to thank the production and the technical team for providing us the technical support. Special thanks to the newsletter, newsletter and media coordination and social media team for the coverage of the event. I would also like to thank the designing team for the creative support. I also wish to thank the administrative staff of BNE. Special thanks to our conference partners, knowledge partners, international partners and media partners. The recordings of all the sessions of I Can Sense can be accessed through our official YouTube channel, DME TV, our social media handles, I Can Page, and DME Page, and subscribe to DME TV. Now we will have certificate distribution, and I would like to invite Dr.